Welcome to Spine Academy. In this instructional video, we're going to discuss my surgical technique for putting in C1 lateral mass screws. It's important when you're putting in C1 screws to understand some of the adjacent structures so you know what to avoid, what to protect, and also how to move quickly through the procedure to minimize blood loss. In this video, we're gonna discuss my surgical technique for kind of sequencing instruments and the sequence of views that I like to get so that you can safely and accurately put C1 lateral mass screws in your practice. In this video, we're going to talk about the surgical technique for placement of a C1 lateral mass screw. Now, this is a very useful technique to understand for type 2 odontoid fractures or other types of trauma, tumors, or other degenerative processes. The C1 itself, vertebral body and the lateral mass, a very unique structure with some important structures around it. And we're gonna dedicate a specific surgical technique video just to the placement of that. If you look at the C1 vertebral body, this is a top-down view of the C1 vertebral body. So you can see here how the condyle might articulate with the top surface of C1 right here. This is the so-called superior articular process of both sides. And this is the surface that the condyles or the skull would really sit on. The C1 ring, as it's often referred to, obviously, is a closed loop. So you can see here the anterior arch of C1 with the anterior tubercle right here. That's that prominence right in the midline. You can wrap around to the lateral mass on one side. This is the lateral mass over here. And you can see that the posterior arch wraps all the way around here. Again, it's a closed ring in most people to another uh, lateral mass right here. And so you can see that this is the boundaries of the, of the second contralateral lateral mass. The C1 lateral mass is a paired structure and the screws when you put them in is usually paired. Usually you'll put a screw in on both sides. Now there are a couple of important structures that are around there. Of course the spinal cord with the dura around it sits right in the spinal canal there. You can see here there's this lateral tubercle, a lateral process here with a small hole called the foramen transversarium. Now that carries an important structure called the vertebral artery that you'll see in some of the other animations and illustrations. That vessel comes out of this hole it comes around the side of the C1 body and over the posterior arch in something called the sulcus arteriosus. So it kind of wraps around this structure above the posterior arch. So this screw typically goes in below the arch and we'll show that both cadaverically and also in illustrations. Here you can see that the screw itself, this is a typical C1 lateral mass screw, starts about the midpoint of the lateral mass from the back in terms of medial to lateral, and it goes down the long axis of the C1 lateral mass about five to 10 degrees medialized. So you can see here how this is a touch medialized and this screw over here is a touch medialized. That's the typical trajectory for a C1 lateral mass screw. Importantly, it goes underneath the posterior arch. So you can see here the tulip, the screw, it kind of disappears a little bit right here and then enters the lateral mass and then goes down the length of the lateral mass. Now the proportions of this are useful, but this is a good view for showing it. You can see about two thirds of the length of the screw is in bone and about one third of it is not. So this portion often does not have threads on it and you'll have, this is something so-called a lag screw. This is the lag portion of the screw here and this is the threaded portion of the screw here. The length of the screw I usually use is typically 30 millimeters of which 20 millimeters will be threaded and 10 millimeters will be not. And you can see again, that's symmetric. So you'd use the same type of screw on both sides under the arch on both sides. If you look at the C1 again, with respect to the rest of the spine, this shows you just from the front, it sits right at the top of the spine. This is the C2 vertebral body here with the odontoid process there. That's why it's useful for type 2 odontoid fractures. And then all of the bones below it, C3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This uh, illustration really shows the vertebral artery going through the foramen transversarium. It goes laterally at C2, up through that foramen transversarium, and then around and into the skull. This is looking at it from the front, but if you spin this image around, you kind of get the sense that, again, you're looking at C1 at the top here. This is the vertebral artery kind of wrapping around here. This is that posterior arch we talked about. This is the C2 vertebral body here. This is the spinous process of it. It's usually very prominent 
and bifid and a par screw, which is a typical screw to put in here would go in right about there. So we'll get into that more, but understanding where C1 and C2 are relative to the lateral mass and the structures below, very useful. Now, if you kind of zoom more in just into C1, this is looking at it from the back. So this is again that spinous process, the bifid process of C2. You could see the posterior arch of C2 here and the posterior arch of C1 right there. You also see the vertebral artery coming up and around into the space above the posterior arch. So this is that sulcus arteriosus that it's sitting in right here. And again, it's a paired structure. You can see it kind of sitting above the arch on both sides. So our area of interest is really gonna be below this. You can see again the posterior arch of C2 here. This is that back wall of the lateral mass and you can kind of see it. It's a little bit deep to the plane. It's ventral to this structure right there. So if you think about where the screw itself is gonna go, it typically goes in underneath the arch, this spot right here where you see that red dot. So you'd see it on both sides over here. It's about the midpoint of the lateral mass. But I use a very important structure, the C2 pars, which often I'll put a C2 pars screw in before putting in a C1 lateral mass screw. And that's because the pars of C2 is right here. So the screw itself would sit about here. The screws below it, the lateral mass screws of three, four would all kind of line up so that the idea is to make all the screws collinear in the same parasagittal plane. And that would be the case on both sides. So you can see here again where that entry site would be over here. Now, if you imagine rotating the spine once again, you could see that you come underneath this posterior arch to the back wall of the lateral mass here. So this is the lateral mass. This is the back of it. This is the bottom surface of it or the inferior articular process of it. And that articulates, of course, with C2. And then this is wrapping around the front. This is that anterior tubercle that I showed from the top down. So your screw would typically start right about here and it would be directed kind of straight towards that anterior tubercle, pretty parallel to this posterior arch, the back wall of the posterior arch. So here's an example of a screw that might fly in and you can kind of see how it comes underneath the posterior arch and then it would be directed into this process or into the structure right here called the lateral mass. You can see it's directed right towards the anterior tubercle. You saw two screws fly in here. If you look at it from the back again, it starts again right about the midpoint of the lateral mass. This tulip right here would line up nicely with the pars and the subaxial sub screws if you have any of those as well. And it's directed just a little bit medially. So you can see how you steer away from this vertebral artery. You stay safe by being under the posterior arch and you aim medial to avoid that. So if you were to take a view of this from the top down, which is again similar to that first illustration I showed, you can see that it starts back here. The tulip will sit somewhere proud. There'll be a span here that has no threads on it, and then it enters the lateral mass, and it traverses medially to stay away from the vertebral artery. And this is a very strong screw that we'll show you how to place in a cadaver model. So let's dive right in. The C1 lateral mass screws are usually terminal screws. That means that they are usually screws at the end of a construct. Most of the time when I put a C1 lateral mass screw in, I will have C2 screws in, and I like to use PAR screws. If you haven't seen the technique video on C2 PAR screws, that's probably a useful prerequisite to this video. But in this video, we're gonna cover C1 lateral mass screws. So if you look at an image of the cervical spine from the back, again, C1 is right at the top here. You can see the posterior arch of C1 and the lateral masses just kind of in front of that posterior arch, just below them where the screws themselves go in. So, I like to line up all my screws. So I make sure if I put a C2 PAR screw in or a C3 lateral mass screw in or any of these, you can see here the start points for where those screws might be. And I will carry that same line straight up to the back of the lateral mass of C1. So here you can kind of see where the start point would be so that it all lines up. And I think that planning helps making sure everything aligns nicely and you can drop your rods nicely at the end. But so here you can see the start point would be here and over here lining up nicely with everything below. So here's a cadaver dissection where we've already put in the C2 PAR screws. And you can see here how the screws kind of line up pretty nicely. Usually once I've got those screws in, I'll use a head turner to really be sure I can kind of define what that paramedian plane is. So here you can see kind of a line there. Here you can see the line there. You can just see the C1 lateral mass here. So my dissection will be immediately above that. Now, I always put in C1 lateral mass screws with fluoroscopy. Uh, and the reason that that's important is so that you can really see that your trajectory is aiming properly in the middle of the lateral mass. 
If you have a side view, which is the fluoro image that I typically get, here's what the spine will look like. Now, of course, in the spine, there will already be C2 PARS screws here, and I'd be looking for a nice clean view on lateral fluoroscopy of the posterior arch, the lateral mass, making sure that I have a true lateral view, so something that it doesn't have any distortions or parallax within it. It usually helps if you have your C2 PAR screws in to get a lateral fluoro image and try to get rid of the parallax. So here you can see, you don't see two PAR screws, you see one PAR screw, so knowing that the view is exactly right, so that the view ends up being very straight like that. Now, once you've got that, that gives you kind of a quick and dirty sense that you're probably pretty close to a true lateral projection for the C1 lateral mass screw as well. Once I've got that view, I've got my C2 PAR screws in, I usually will start my dissection under the posterior arch of C1. So again, here's the posterior arch of C1. Again, the head is here. This is uh, kind of caudal as you go down here. I will usually track along the bottom edge of the posterior aspect of the arch of C1 all the way to the back wall of the lateral mass. Once I've got the lateral mass kind of exposed, I'm at that junction between them, I usually will put in a half by half patty, maybe a Penfield 4, and try to sweep that to turn the corner. And here you can kind of see how we're kind of coming around the corner. So we're no longer in that flat portion of the posterior arch, we're kind of turning around to the back wall of the lateral mass there. And I like to expose that pretty cleanly, medially, very aggressively, right to the medial edge of the lateral mass, which is the lateral aspect of the spinal canal. But then laterally, I don't go crazy because the vertebral artery is sitting out laterally. So usually I'll kind of identify the medial border, I'll expose enough laterally to get my screw start point lined up with the C2 screw. And I will do that on both sides and we'll kind of cover that on both sides. Once I've got that exposure kind of cleanly, I usually will put a Penfield 4 right to that junction and I'll get a lateral x-ray. And here's an example of like, the lateral x-ray showing that I'm below, below the arch here at the back of the lateral mass and I'm pretty comfortable with my start point knowing that that would be a pretty good start point for my C1 lateral mass screw. So, there are really two views that are important to illustrate the technique. The first view is gonna be the view that you see as a surgeon when you're looking at the back of the spine. So if you imagine the C1 lateral mass, the, the C1 lateral mass itself looks a bit like this. It's flat, a bit bigger in the midline. So if you imagine the midline is over here, um, this would be the midline of the spine and then this would be the posterior arch over here. The lateral masses tend to be symmetric and so this would be one lateral mass, this would be one lateral mass. This is like if you were looking a little bit deeper into the spine. And then of course the C2 would look like this. This would be the superior articular process of C2. Here would be the arch over here. The spinous process would be over here. So when you're looking at the spine from the back, imagine these are the bony structures that you see. There are a couple of important other structures, of course. There's the nerve itself, the C2 nerve and the thecal sac, and that of course is right in the spinal canal here. So this would be the C2 nerve here and the thecal sac in the midline. So imagine this is all dura here. There's a structure at the side, which is of course kind of concerning, which is called the vertebral artery, which is a structure that runs like this. So it kind of dies laterally at C2, comes through the frame and transversarium and over the top of the arch in the sulcus arteriosus, and that's on both sides here. So those are really important structures that are right in your neighborhood when you're doing these. So usually when I'm doing this, what I will do is I will start by identifying my C2 pars and then the C2 lateral mass screw. So this might be the C2 par screw over here, this would be a good start point for where I want my C1 lateral mass screw to be. So when I'm doing this, I'm really exposing the back of the C1 lateral mass, the medial edge of it over here, and then the lateral edge, I'm not necessarily looking for anything lateral, but I consider this exposure to be really a three-handed maneuver. So I'm gonna have three instruments in at any given time. Part of that is that you never wanna lose sight on the start point you make, because it's kind of in a valley Oftentimes there's a fair amount of bleeding there because of the pararadicular venous complex and because of the paravertebral venous complex. So all of that can create a lot of venous congestion, a lot of bleeding, so here's the technique that I use. I usually will expose the back aspect of the lateral mass, and then as I'm finding that, I will plant two instruments in on either side to create a clear opening that you can see. One of them is gonna be a suction out laterally, and again, I don't go crazy lateral because you don't wanna see the vertebral artery. If you're looking on this side, for example, you'd wanna have something that's out here, just far enough lateral to see your start point. So here you might have the C2 par screw over here. You would extrapolate that up and say, okay, here's a good start point for me. I just want enough room to see that start point. 
And then over here, I usually will put an instrument to kind of pull on the C2 root kind of medially and caudally, so you've got a nice box that you can work in. So it requires really three instruments. One of them will be a Penfield 4, typically that's what I use, suction out laterally, and then the third instrument is the instrument you're using to, make, to cannulate the lateral mass itself. So I use a high-speed burr and then a tap and then put the screw in. But the whole time, I never really leave an instrument out of that if I'm not looking directly at it. So that's to really help with your exposure. This is the view from the back. And this is a really important view to kind of understand when, how you do the dissection. The other view that's very important is a view from the side. So if you imagine looking at it from the side, this would be kind of the normal structures that you see from the side. So what, what we're looking at here is gonna be the lateral mass, the anterior tubercle. This is of course a graphical kind of illustration of it. Here you can see the posterior arch. There's this kind of prominence at the back of the posterior arch. This would be the inferior articular process at the bottom of the lateral mass here. And then you would have something that looks like this for the C2 pars itself. This is gonna be the C12 space. And then this is the condyle that sits, you know, the bottom of the skull that articulates with C1. So the space that you're working in to put the screw in is really the junction between the back here, the bottom of the posterior arch, and the back wall of the lateral mass. This is a good start point. This is where your start point is. So the screw usually goes in like this. Usually you'll aim towards the anterior tubercle, and that's where you want your screw to be. Now, because this is kind of seated deep and your par screw might be somewhere up here, you wanna make sure that your screw is long enough to give you a tulip that's kind of in line with that. You can't overseed it, you won't be able to connect it in with the rod. So this is usually the fluted part or the threaded part of the screw. And then this is usually a portion of the screw that has no thread on it. So it's so-called lag screw. So this would be a smooth shank screw and you'll see that when I'm putting in the screw in the cadaver dissection. But this is really an important view to imagine because that's the view you have on lateral fluoroscopy. And then this is an important view to have so you understand the structures around you and understand the workflow for making sure you can put it in safely without violating any of the structures, the canal medially or the vertebral artery laterally, and also safely putting it in so that you know you're getting the right trajectory with your screw. So now that we've established those illustrations, let's get back to putting in the lateral mass screw. So once again, on this view, you can see the posterior arch of C1. You can see the back of the lateral mass. I usually will make my start point with the drill using a 1.7 millimeter drill bit. Uh, once I've made my start point, again, at that intersection between the posterior arch and the posterior wall of the lateral mass, I make my start point, I'll check an x-ray with it, and then adjust my trajectory, and then I actually cannulate the lateral mass, leaning it just five to eight degrees medially using that same drill bit and I'll go to a depth of 15 millimeters, which is usually where the hub of that bit is. Uh, once I've done that, I will check an x-ray to make sure I'm happy with the trajectory of it and that it's aiming straight for that anterior uh, tubercle of C1. Now, once I've verified that that's in a good position, I usually will come back in first with a bolted probe, but then with a tap. And the tap will look something like this, where I've identified again that pilot hole. I'll tap from a very small, again, a 1.7 millimeter bit will give you about a two millimeter pilot hole. Uh, and so I use a conical tap that will expand that two millimeter pilot hole to something that will accept a 3.5 millimeter screw. So it's usually a little bit smaller. It's a three millimeter tap. It will leave maybe a 3.2 millimeter pilot hole. Once I'm happy, I'll check usually a start point to see where I've started. And then I'll get another x-ray once I'm at the full depth to make sure I'm happy with the trajectory of it. Again, this is for the pilot hole for the screw. I'll remove it. And then I go straight to a ball to probe. Now again, as I had mentioned earlier, I usually use a three-hand technique for this. So I will try to expose with a Penfield 4 medially, you can see it over here, usually a sucker out laterally, and these two instruments would more or less be in place throughout the maneuvering of putting the screw in. So the tap, the balls are broke, everything, I'm looking right at it. Uh, because this is in a cadaver environment and I only had uh, two hands, I wasn't able to get an assistant to actually hold anything. And so you'll see some of the soft tissue kind of wicking up into it. But this gives you a pretty good sense of the exposure you would get if you had two instruments in there. Now I would check a ball tip probe 
make sure I'm happy with it here. You can kind of see interestingly here that out lateral to it is the foramen transversarium. That's where the artery itself is. So this is what the screw looks like. You can see the 20, 20 millimeters of threaded part and then the lag part is just beyond that where there is no thread on it. I'm looking at the, the start point, looking at that pilot hole. Typically I'll check one x-ray to kind of make sure I've engaged the hole and I'm happy with it. Uh, and then I advance the screw the full 20 millimeters depth. So again, most of these screws have a threaded portion that's 20 millimeters in length and a lag portion, which is threadless, which is about 10 millimeters in length. And that is so that that portion without the threads doesn't irritate this nerve that sits immediately adjacent to it that you pull down. That's the C2 nerve that you're kind of pulling down here. Um, as I'm doing this, I frequently will check an x-ray to kind of make sure that I'm happy with the trajectory of the screw. That is something that tends to verify that we're in a pretty good trajectory, aiming straight for that anterior tubercle there. And then I will fine tune this by putting the screw in so that the last of the leads, you can just see the lead there disappear within the lateral mass. So I know I have 20 millimeters of purchase and then it sits 10 millimeters proud with a tulip that's just behind the posterior arch. So it lines up really nicely in both dimensions. On a lateral, it would line up nicely, but then in a coronal plane, looking at it from the back, you can see how it lines up really nicely here. And you can use a head turner to kind of verify that it's in a good position. So now that sequence, high speed burr with a 1.7 millimeter drill bit, that's how I like to put these pilot holes in. Then a ball tip probe, a tap, a ball tip probe, and the screw, and of course the screw is pre-planned, so I'm ready, never take my eyes off the start point, so I just ask for the instruments one at a time, we almost rehearse it in advance. Once the screw is in, I put flow seal and a patty around it, and all that venous bleeding stops pretty, pretty promptly after that. So being very quick about it is how you keep the blood loss from that kind of hypervascular area to a minimum. Now, once I've done the left-sided screw, and here you can kind of see the left-sided screw there. Once I've done that, then I'll pay attention to the right-sided screw. So I'll kind of come in here and make sure that I'm doing the exposure the same. Here you can see, again, the C2 par screw extrapolated up. Here's a good start point there at that junction of the posterior arch and the posterior wall of the lateral mass. I come in with my burr. As soon as I get my burr, I usually will kind of create a start point. Again, this is usually a three-handed maneuver. Once I've done that, I'll verify that I like my start point. So I'll get this x-ray and you can see that the start point is just in line. It's right in the right spot. The posterior arch is over here. The posterior wall of the lateral mass is here. And my start point is perfectly in line with the other existing lateral mass screw. So once that's done, I'll adjust my trajectory. I'll kind of want to make sure that I'm not pointing up towards the condyle, but that I'm pointing straight at the anterior tubercle here. And then once I'm happy with that, I will actually advance it again, another 15 millimeters right down into the lateral mass, leaning medially about five to eight degrees. So just a little bit medial. And once I'm happy with that, I'll check an x-ray, make sure I'm happy with that position. Never take my eyes off of that start point. And then I'll migrate to using a tap again. We'll tap the pilot hole, come out with it, make sure again that at a depth that I'm happy with the position of it. So I get this x-ray that shows that the position of it looks good uh, and the trajectory of it looks good. Then I'll come out with that. I'll usually check it with the ball tip probe again, make sure I'm happy with that and then go straight to the screw. So as soon as this is done and I verify that I'm happy with it, here you can see you were kind of checking it, looking at the borders. Never take my eyes off of that pilot start point check it and then I come straight in with the screw and again it's a 30 millimeter screw most of the time that means 20 millimeters of thread 10 millimeters of lag that's the typical screw that I put in sometimes most of these lag screws will have 10 millimeters of lag so if you say 28 you're really getting an 18 millimeters of purchase here and again I'll put this screw in using fluoroscopy to kind of make sure that I'm happy with the position of it kind of checking it along the way so here we are halfway you check an x-ray and it looks like it's in pretty good uh, alignment kind of following its way straight up towards the anterior tubercle here, seating just the last little bit of it so those threads completely seat and I'm happy with its position both in this plane, so the corona, like making sure that they're in the same parasagittal plane, and then looking at it from the side to make sure it's at a good depth so that I could lock those in with, with a rod if I wanted to. Once that's in, again, I put hemostasis, put a little flow seal and a, and a patty down. I kind of let everything stay dry. And you can see, you can really do this procedure with very little blood loss. And you can see that these look like they're pretty good. They do line up. 
I usually will bring in, like I'll check an x-ray and make sure I'm happy with the final position of it, and then I'll bring in a head turner and just make sure that I kind of fine tune them all. You can see these are sagittally biased screws and these are medially biased screws that allows them all to line up beautifully. If this is all you're doing, then you drop rods right here. If you're putting screws down, like you can see we made some start points for C3 and below, you can put those screws in and then drop your rods, but you can see they all line up very neatly. So that is how you put C1 screws in. We have both in, because again, I use the C2 par screws to kind of orient you, so it helps you kind of get a frame of reference for your C1 lateral mass screws. And then, depending on what else you're putting in, you can put in more of the instrumentation, but that's my technique. Now, in a cadaver type setting, it's very valuable to see stuff that you don't usually see. So here you can see the posterior arch, and we're dissecting it with a periosteal. I'm kind of getting into that uh, above the posterior arch, looking at the sulcus arteriosus and the vertebral artery. And you can see like this is where the vertebral artery is gonna run. It'll come out of the foramen transversarium here, kind of run up above the posterior arch, which is why when we put these in, I stay safe. I stay below it. We don't necessarily need to be above it. I will study the CAT scan in advance and make sure there's not a dehiscence or some abnormality there that might expose the vertebral artery to jeopardy. Usually you don't have to worry about it, but you can see that's where the vert would run. Similarly, I'm kind of stripping the periosteum over here and you can kind of see how we're exposing that same pocket that would sit in. In a cadaver, there's obviously no blood flow, so no pulsatile flow, so you can't really discern it because the vessel itself is collapsed, but that's where you find it. Now, on this side, we actually had found the foramen transversarium sitting out here, so it would go up through there, come over the top, in the sulcus arteriosus and kind of migrate into the dura, go through the foramen magnum, like that's where the vertebral artery would typically sit. You don't need to see that as a general rule, certainly for this procedure, but in a cadaver, I always find it valuable. If you find yourself doing a posterior cervical dissection, I'd encourage you to look at it. I wanted to put that in the video just so you have a sense of what you're not seeing, but how close you are to the vertebral artery when you put in C1 lateral mass screws. In this video, we covered the technique for putting in C1 lateral mass screws. As I mentioned at the beginning, usually a C1 screw is put in with subaxial or axial screws. So that would be C2 par screws or screws below that. It's usually a terminal screw. And whether you're putting one of these in for a type 2 odontoid fracture or a tumor or some instability or some other indication, I think really understanding the C1 anatomy, understanding the technique for safely putting it in is very important to understand and important to practice. And to that end, I hope that you found this instructional video useful. I look forward to seeing you in future chapters and future instructional videos for Spine Academy. Thank you for watching.